Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be with you again to lead you in morning worship here at Fruhe. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise and glory in hymn 201. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before him his glory proclaim. bow down before you, we proclaim your glory, we praise you with all our hearts, because we know that you are God, because we know that in you is life and joy and love. We worship you because you, your life is always new, and you sustain us by your vitality. We love you because you always care but never stifle. We depend on you and we remember your goodness to us and to those who have gone before us. We tell your story in every generation. You are our God, the God of Abram, Isaac and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of a pilgrim people, your church. 
we give all praise and glory to you, the God who loves us through Jesus Christ, who saves us, and who raises us to a new dimension of fellowship in his spirit. Blessing and honour and glory and praise, this is the theme of the hymn that we raise. We confess our sins, O God. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is the true vine, and we are the branches. We confess that we've become separated from you by willfulness when we seek our own satisfaction, by forgetfulness when we neglect the true reason for gathering in this building, by aimlessness when we are carried along by life's routines, by self-centeredness when we look inward at our own needs and problems and fail to look outward on what is true and noble and loving. So too, in the silence, we remember that we have sinned in thought and in word and in deed, as well as in the things we have left undone. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, and give you time to amend your lives, through Jesus Christ our Lord, that our hearts and our minds may be cleansed white as snow, and that our lives may be renewed for the faithful, dedicated, sacrificial service of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Old Testament book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 27 at verse 1. Genesis 27 at verse 1. Hear the word of God. When Isaac grew old, and his eyes became so dim that he could not see, he called to his elder son Esau and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. Isaac said, Listen now, I am old, and I do not know when I may die. Take your hunting gear, your quiver and your bow, go out into the country and get me some venison. Then make me a savoury dish of the kind I like, and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening as Isaac talked to his son Esau. When Esau went off into the country to find some venison and bring it home, she said to her son Jacob, I heard your father talking to your brother Esau, and he said, Bring some venison to me and make it into a savoury dish, so that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before I die. Listen to me, my son, and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and pick me out two fine young kids, and I will make them into a, a savoury dish for your father, the kind he likes. Then take them to your father, and he will eat them, so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob said to his mother Rebekah, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, and my skin is smooth. Suppose my father fuels me, he will know I am tricking him, and I shall bring a curse upon myself instead of a blessing. His mother answered him, let the curse fall on me, my son, but do as I say, go and bring the kid. So Jacob fetched them and brought them to his mother, who made them into a savoury dish of the kind his father liked. Then Rebekah took her elder son's clothes, 
Esau's best clothes, which she kept by her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. She put the goat skins on his hands and on the smooth nape of his neck. And she handed her son Jacob the savoury dish and the bread she had made. He came to his father and said, Father, he answered, Yes, my son, who are you? Jacob. His father answered, I am Esau, your elder son. I have done as you told me. Come, sit up and eat some of my venison so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac said to his son, What is this that you found so quickly? And Jacob answered, It is what the Lord your God put in my way. Isaac then said to Jacob, Come close and let me feel you, my son, to see whether you really are my son Esau. When Jacob came close to his father, Isaac felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like Esau, and that is why he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? And he answered, Yes. Then Isaac said, Bring me some of your venison to eat, my son, so that I may give you my blessing. Then Jacob brought it to him, and he ate it, and he brought wine also, and he drank it. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near my son, and kiss me. So he came near and kissed him. When Isaac smelt the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the open country, blessed by the Lord. God give you dew from heaven, and the richness of the earth corn and new wine of plenty people shall serve you nations bow down to you be lord over your brothers may your mother's sons bow down to you a curse upon those who curse you and a blessing on those who bless you thanks be to God now we continue in our worship by singing a hymn about the Holy Scriptures, hymn 601, Look Upon Us, Blessed Lord.
Time now for our second scripture lesson from the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. And this is now going to be read for us by Joyce. Hebrews 11 at verse 1. May God bless to us these readings from his word, and to his name be the glory and the praise. Now our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Lord God our Father, we have listened to your word, and we have thought about your truth. Our hearts and our minds are full of gratitude when we remember all that you have given us, and all that you have done for us. We come now to say thank you for your goodness and for your love. We thank you for life, for our birth into this world which you have called into being. We thank you for our humanity, for the opportunity to live in companionship with you and with each other, and for our capacity to understand and discover, to invent and to devise, to be unselfish, and to be courageous. We thank you for all the good things we enjoy every day, for food and drink, and for comfortable homes, for the love and friendship of family and friends, for the satisfaction of work well done, for time to rest and to relax. But most of all, we thank you, Father God, for Jesus, who grew as we grew, who lived our life and who died our death. But we praise you for the glory of God and the glory of man in the life and in the words and in that self-sacrificing death and mighty resurrection of your Son, our Lord. And we thank you that he has called us into his church, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord God, our Father, for everything 
because everything comes from you help us Father accept our thanks and we pray that you will accept our thanks and help to use help us to use your gifts wisely for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord Hear us, Father, as we pray for our fellow men and women and help us to know our kinship with them as brothers and as sisters in your family. Break down the prejudice and the selfishness and the fear that separate men and women from each other. Help the nations of this world to find a way to live together in peace. In peace with honour. Forgive the arrogance of the strong and the resentment of the weak. Bless the work of all those who are bringing aid to needy countries throughout the world. And show us how we must bridge the gap between wealth and poverty and plenty and hunger. Father, we pray for those who find the pace and strain of life too much for them. Those fearing redundancy. Those who have lost confidence in themselves. For those who are slowing down through illness or increasing years. For those who are oversensitive to criticism. For those who are overworked and underpaid. For all who are worn down in body or in mind by the burdens they must carry. Give your help and guidance, Lord God, to all whose work affects the lives of others. Give wisdom to Elizabeth, our Queen, and all her house. Give integrity to our leaders in our parliaments. We pray for those who bear the burden of decision in government we pray for industrialists and men and women of business and trades union leaders to all who control the mass media of communication may those who have power over their fellow men and women use it with sense and restraint for the good of all and always for your glory Bless and strengthen the bonds of family life within our land. Teach us how to understand one another better, parents and children and husbands and wives. And through deeper understanding, deepen our love. May peace and joy dwell in our hearts and in our homes. Father, we bring to you now the special needs of people known to us as neighbours and as friends, those who are sick, those who are bereaved, those who are lonely, those who are afraid, those who are ashamed, those who are bitter. And again, we remember all those throughout the world suffering from the coronavirus. You know the needs of your people better than we do. So give them, we pray, not what we ask, but what your great love directs. Eternal God, we trust you not for this world alone, but for the world to come. We remember our own loved ones who have passed through death to a new life. For their memory we give thanks. And for our fellowship and presence with them now in your presence. Bring us at the last to where they are, to those things which our lips cannot utter, but which our hearts long for, in the glory of your King. And to you, O God, Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy Spirit, be glory as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen. Now our pre-sermon hymn. Him one six two, the God of Abram prays. One six two.
Son and God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3, we read, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The three names have been so inextricably linked together for so many centuries that they trip off the tongue with ease and with familiarity. In these days of superstars, superstars on the stage, on the screen, on the football field or in the Olympics, of course, they were the three great superstars of the patriarchal history of the modern nation of Israel. For the Jew, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they stand right at the top of his role of honour. Because he owes to them not only the most stirring and vital chapters of his people's history, but he owes to them the beginnings of his religion. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, these three illustrious men of God from whom have come down to the Jewish people the assurance that they belong to a divinely chosen race and that they will rank with preeminence among the nations of the world. Christians likewise, of course, must surely hold these three in great esteem. The Christian religion, remember, originally it was an offshoot of Judaism, Thus for us too, I'm sure, Abram and Isaac and Jacob occupy a place of deep regard and even of high affection. But today, I want to examine them, try to take these men out of the dim and distant past. I want to bring the old portraits out of their crumbling and decaying frames, so to speak and clothe them with flesh and blood. Let's try to see these three among the people we know, among those whom we, with whom we live and work and move. In other words, can we try to see the patriarchs not only as individuals but as types, types of people. Remember it was from them these three old world superstars that our own religion sprang. Matthew's Gospel begins by tracing Jesus' human descent through the, from Abraham in the genealogies at the beginning of his Gospel. So I think it would be useful to see in their representatives down through the ages the kind of folk to whom our religion has made its appeal. The kind of folk for whom our religion was meant. First of all, Abram. To the Jew, to the Muslim, to the Christian alike, he's known as the father of the faithful. As such, he seems to tower high above the stature of ordinary humanity. Indeed, the New Testament entitles him the friend of God. Yet, if you read his life story, you'll find that these titles were bestowed on him not because he was the proverbial paragon of all virtues, not because his character was in all respects blameless, but because he had two qualities, two particular qualities, which lit up his life and which prompted his every action. In the first place, Abraham was a man of obedience. God said to him, go, and he went. Abraham, at the ripe old age of 75, took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and left behind a comfortable life in Haran to journey to the land to which God would direct him. It was hard. But God said to him, go, and in obedience he went. Abram set out. Throughout the centuries, 
All the really great men have been like that. Moses, he was brought up, remember, as a royal prince in the house of Egypt. But God said to him, Moses, I want you to leave all this behind and lead my people out of bondage in Egypt through the desert and into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It was hard. But God said to Moses, go. And in obedience, he went. One of the greatest saints of relatively modern times was undoubtedly Dr. Albert Schweitzer. A brilliant student, he in due course became a doctor of philosophy. He was a professor in Strasbourg, in the university there. He was a magnificent exponent of the organ and probably the world's greatest authority on the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. But then he began to hear the miseries of the natives in Central Africa and dropping all his other work he studied for a degree as a doctor of medicine and his wife trained as a nurse. Both of them gave up everything and they set off for Africa to open a hospital for the natives. It was hard how to give up a life of fame and of comfort and of ease and to go away to the difficulties and to the dangers of darkest Africa. But God said to Albert Schweitzer, go, and in obedience he went. Schweitzer, like Abraham before him, dropped everything in order to obey God. Abraham was a man of obedience. But moreover, and fundamentally, Abraham was a man of faith. The Apostle Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans that Abraham's faith preceded his work. He obeyed only because he first believed God's promise. Faith was Abraham's supreme quality. It was by faith, as Joyce read to us, that he left his native land and went out not knowing where he was going. It was by faith that he looked for the promised land, a city which had foundations, whose builder and architect is God. It was by faith that he believed the divine promises, however incredible they must have seemed at the time. But Abram's faith was a faith well tested. For you recall that it was by faith too that Abram offered up Isaac, his only son, as a sacrifice to God. Take your son, you'll remember the story, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Abram was stunned. Offerings to the Lord were nearly always rams or young lambs, never ever human beings. But the grief stricken father loaded his donkey with provisions and wood. And then with his son and two servants he began his journey. After three days they reached the spot chosen by God and there the patriarch cheerfully set, it, set to it to bound his terrified boy and placed him on that altar. And as Abram, with knife in hand, braced himself to sacrifice Isaac, the angel of the Lord called to him, Stop! Don't harm the lad. Now I know that you fear God. I see you are willing not to withhold your only son even. And when Abram looked up, standing there behind him miraculously, from out of nowhere was a ram, which with relief and thanksgiving he offered as a burnt offering in place of Isaac. Abram's faith was tested by God, and his unflinching and unswerving loyalty was rewarded yet again by divine blessing. And it was that faith, simple, unquestioning, wholehearted, tested and obedient, which made Abram the great saint, the great superstar of the Old Testament. And you know, in a sense we still have Abrams with us 
the sense of modern life, folk like Schweitzer and countless other people since, types to whom the Christian, to whom the religion of Jesus Christ makes even in this day and generation an immediate, instinctive, almost automatic appeal, just because they find in the person of Christ someone in whom they can implicitly believe and confidently trust. And it's that faith which colours their whole outlook. It's that faith which dictates their whole way of life. And however difficult that way of life may be, their feet are nevertheless firmly set in it. And whoever tortures and steep the road, they just refuse to doubt that someday they will arrive. The Abrams. The great pioneers of the faith. And then Isaac, of whom we don't really know a great deal. The detail on his portrait is rather less sharp than on the other two. Even the role of honour in the letter to the Hebrews dismisses him in one brief verse. However, we do know that he was a peaceful man, blessed by the Lord and dedicated to the God of his fathers. And we can glean further that he was the type who put his religion into his home. He put his religion into his work and into his day-to-day -day life. And so his name is included in that great patriarchal trio. Isaac represents the ordinary man. And goodness, today's world is so full of ordinary folk. In a way, he is the patron saint of all of us. Showing us what our religion should mean to us. Isaac represents the person with no claims to either fame or notoriety. The person whose gifts and opportunities are both limited. The person who walks through life and his walk takes him neither along the heights nor through the dark valleys. But along the level, uninspiring, monotonous plain. And of course, it was for such people that Christianity was meant. God sent his son into the world, not merely to the elect few of special merit and holiness, not that they only may be saved, but that the world of ordinary people through him might be saved. And it's to such people that our religion still makes its strongest appeal, and it's from them that it still gets its main support. The strength and the future of the church rests today, as it has done in the past, not on its theologians, not on its dignitaries, but on its ordinary members, the faithful people in the pew, Sunday by Sunday, the humble workers in the church's various organisations, the types who apply their religion to their everyday life, the people who, like the patriarchs of old, wherever they live and rest and work, build an altar for the Lord. And then finally, Jacob. Surely the least likely material imaginable out of which to emerge one of the great patriarchs. He's presented initially as a highly unattractive character whose very, whose very name many commentators suggest means the supplanter, the smart deal, the white boy, the dell boy of his day and generation, who outsmarted and swindled Esau, his twin brother, out of his birthright and cheated him out of his father's blessing, as we read. The type who was ever out of what he could get, astute, greedy, double dealing, yet God took Jacob and slowly and gradually moulded him into one of his greatest champions and ambassadors. By discipline and by spiritual discernment, Jacob triumphed over his weakness and became a source of blessing. The supplanter became Israel. And today, there are still in the ranks of society Jacob's in abundance. They feature in all generations the types that were neither great pioneers of faith like Abraham, nor faithful plodders 
like Isaac, but times who knew what temptation was and who were very often unable to resist it. People who knew the right and so often chose the wrong, who yearned for the best but whose weaker, baser selves all too often tried. Such types there have always been, such types there still are, and such types to some extent we all are. And it was in response to the cry of the Jacobs of the world that God sent Christ, who came not to call the righteous but to call sinners to repentance. And they are found on every page of the Gospels, the old Jacob with a new name, Matthew, Zacchaeus, Mary Magdalene, and a whole host of others whose names we shall never know but who found in the person of Jesus Christ the forgiveness, the power and the peace for which they had given up hoping yet so desperately needed. And to this very day they are to be found on every page of the Book of Life. Men and women who, when finding it impossible to be what they long to be, and unable to work out their own salvation, men and women who have put their hands and their lives into the hand of the man from Galilee, and they too have been transformed from Jacob's into Israel's. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. From Saul the persecutor to Paul the apostle. And that kind of divine miracle is still happening. Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Tom, Dick, and Harry. And the love of God and the gospel of his son is for every one of them. Glory be to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen. And now we're going to listen to some contemplative music, at the end of which our offering will be presented for dedication. Thank you, sir.
some beautiful variations there on Brother James's ear, and beautifully played as always by Sandy. Thank you. Let us pray. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. God our Father, we give thanks that God in Jesus Christ is our shepherd and that he leads us as you of old led the great patriarchs through the stories contained in the Old Testament. Help us to respond always to his leading, to go where he would have us go, to live as he would have us live and to love as the good shepherd would have us love. We remember the love Jesus expressed for us when he laid down his life on that cross of Calvary, that supreme sacrifice. And now we offer our reasonable service and our reasonable sacrifices in the form of our gifts of money to do the work of the Good Shepherd in the world today. Take our gifts, magnify them, bless them, bless us who give, that all men and women and children everywhere may come to know of the love of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Redeemer and our Lord. Amen. O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Hymn 352.
Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you this day. And remain with you ever. Amen.